We are live now. Good evening, delegates and participants. Thank you for joining Shield Connect, and we are back with our hit series Icons in Conversation with Dr. Ritu. And today the topic is overview of recurrent pregnancy loss. And today Dr. Rekha Gupta uh, is the icon who will speak on this topic. So before we start with the session, let me give a brief introduction of Dr. Ritu Santwani ma'am and Dr. Rekha Gupta. So Dr. Ritu Santwani ma'am has done MBBS, MD, FICOG, FIOG, AMRCOG. Ma'am is obstetrician and gynecologist in IVF. And ma'am is founder and CEO of 360 Degree Healthcare Studio. Ma'am is also a consultant in Inamdar Multi Specialty Hospital in Pune and infertility test to baby specialist. And ma'am is co-founder of MAAM, board member of WSCG. And now welcome uh, our icon of the day, Dr. Rekha Gupta. Ma'am is done MBBS, MS, and ma'am is infertility and IVF specialist. Ma'am is director at Sanjeevni Test to Baby Center in Kanpur. Ma'am is treasurer of Kanpur Obstetric and Gynecological Society. Ma'am is secretary of IHRF Kanpur Society, library secretary of IMA Kanpur, and guest faculty at uh, several national conferences, including ISAR, AICOG, and IFS. Uh, field of interest is IVF. Ma'am is trained at uh, Sir Gangaram Hospital, New Delhi, and ma'am was uh, embryology at Global Rainbow Healthcare in Agra, then in TVS at Dr. Sonal Panchal Center in Ahmedabad. And uh, me, uh, and also hysteroscopy at Dr. Osama Shawski's workshop and laparoscopy at Bhatia Global Hospital and Endosurgery Institute in New Delhi. So we welcome you, ma'am, on our platform for today's uh, webinar. And uh, I will hand over the session to Dr. Ritu, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Nishan. Uh, a very, very warm welcome to my dear friend, uh, Rekha Ji. Rekha Ji, we are really thankful to you that you have taken out your precious time. So friends, as you all are aware, the recurrent pregnancy loss, uh, though we are in practice from last so many years, but every time there is a dilemma for treating of the recurrent pregnancy loss. So what to treat, what to give, what not to give, how to counsel the patient. There are so many things every day it's coming a new concept whether we have to start the aspirin preconceptionally and up to what gestation we have to give the aspirin in the patients of the recurrent pregnancy loss, whether to go for the prophylactic osteitis, is it okay or not? Like this, there are so many dilemmas in everyone's mind. So to discuss with all this today, my dear friend and senior uh, Rekha Ji is here. Rekha Ji, a very, very warm welcome on this platform. And I must uh, welcome to all of my dear friends who have joined all across the geography. So friends, as all of you are aware, my, this program is based on the knowledge sharing. And we all know that knowledge always increases by sharing. So now without wasting much time, I'm handing over the dais to uh, Rekha Ji. And she will discuss with us regarding the overview of the recurrent pregnancy loss. And later on, we can discuss whatever the online question answers we will receive. Yeah, over to you, Rekha Ji. Hmm. Thank you so much, Dr. Ritu. And uh, very true, you uh, said that knowledge sharing, I think this is the largest platform of our country where the knowledge is shared so nicely and so keenly. And uh, namaskar to all our seniors and friends. And it is indeed my honor and privilege to share the platform of this online show, which is most popular and renowned worldwide. I take this opportunity to sincerely thank our stalwart and pioneer, Dr. Ritu Santwani, whom we all know for her devotion, her uh, love for academics, perseverance, and knowledge sharing. So uh, to get started, friends, uh, we take up this topic for today, recurrent pregnancy loss, which is a common acquaintance in our day-to-day -day practice. And as uh, rightly said by Dr. Ritu, we are always in a you know, uh, confusion state, what to do and what not to do. So very rightly uh, quoted by Ritu, this is a dilemma for us doctors. And uh, repetition being the mother of learning, let's revisit our facts. So in the next couple of minutes, I'll trade you through this important entity, friends. 
and just uh, give me a minute to share my screen yeah sure 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 so uh recurrent pregnancy loss as we all know when a patient walks into our clinic uh, she is uh, actually so frustrated and so uh, depressed and on the uh, other hand we doctors are also in a dilemma as ritu has said and uh, but if we are a bit patient and we uh, carefully analyze the patient to identify the causes of pregnancy loss and outline a basic evaluation for the recurrent pregnancy loss and then uh, see for the current treatment modalities we will be in a much uh, more comfortable position so to uh, define recurrent pregnancy loss is a condition when a woman has had two or more clinical pregnancy losses before the pregnancy reached 20 weeks so uh, there are things that should be kept in our mind actually what happens is that uh, there are other things we look into but some things are a bit forgotten so always see the age of the patient if the patient is above 40 it's a very uh, strong reason to believe that her oocyte quality might be decreased and that might be the cause and uh, as it affects the ovarian function the rpl risk is as high as 75% in a woman who is aged more than 45 years uh, another important point is uh, if she is giving a history of miscarriages that itself is a another uh, risk factor to increase her risk for the uh, uh, pregnancy loss for the pregnancy loss so risk for subsequent pregnancy loss is estimated to be 24% after two clinically recognized losses 30% after three losses and it jumps to 40 to 50% after four losses so we just have to curb her uh, pregnancy losses to be on a comfortable position so the causes as we all know there is a major chunk of unexplained causes uh, round about the half uh, like 50% of the patients will have always unexplained uh, will always remain unexplained but if we just go to uh, you know our minor uh, details we'll see that they will be uh, classified in some of the following like the anatomical cause which uh, 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 comes to the tune of 12 to 15 uh, 12 to 16% of the causes the endocrine cause actually are a major chunk so there are n number of endocrine causes where uh, the incidence will fall to 17 to 20% of the uh, uh, whole Uh, rpl causes immunological again a very important uh, cause not to forget it comes uh, in 10 to 16% of patients are responsible uh, immunological causes are responsible in 10 to 16% of our rpl patients genetic causes also are very important 3 to 3.5 to 5% though now they say the incidence is actually rising with the advent of uh, smoking and drinking in our ladies the genetic causes are on the rise and also we don't have to forget the infection infections that cause the rpl and the environmental causes so uh, once we uh, have these causes in mind the anatomical though uh, actually we tend not to remember but uh, we should keep in mind that uh, a patient who comes with rpl and if she uh, goes for a hysteroscopy or a 3d uh, tbs it will do her good because many times we come across separate uterus in a hysteroscopy and uh, actually uh, the incidence is pretty uh, high uh, though we think that uh, it's a very rare cause but no when you come when you do a hysteroscopy or a 3d tbs we do come across uh, separate uterus and uh, of course the biconvoluted uterus the uniconvoluted uterus the t shaped uteri the submucoid fibroids have to be kept in mind we have to examine the patient for that and uh, of course endometrial polyps are also sometimes the culprit cervical incompetence has not to be forgotten because uh, anatomical causes they do flash in our mind but uh, maybe she is having those mid trimester abortions and we have to check her uh, 
uh, cervical length every time uh, in two weeks after 12 weeks. And of course, in triterine regions, the major cause is the tubercular infection. And in our part of the country, it is really rampant. Tuberculosis is really rampant. It is the cause for infertility. It is the cause for the recurrent RPLs. It is cause. Uh, it is the cause for IUGR, cause for IUDs. So tuberculosis has to be kept in mind. So what is the actual uh, mode they affect? Uh, of course, once we have septa or we have adhesions, we'll have smaller uterine cavities. There will be less implantation sites for the embryo. And of course, the major cause is the lack of vascularization. So what happens when the blood supply is diminished for the fetus? We have uh, uh, abortions because of the, uh, the fetal fail, fails to grow. So just a look at the separate uterus. It is the most common anomaly in about 55% of the antipical defects. It uh, uh, plays a major role and it can be a complete, incomplete or segmental uh, septa. When 25% uh, of the patients having septa will uh, have early abortions, only 6.2% will have late or late abortions or premature labors. What about the unique ornate uterus? So of course, it is also responsible for 20% of the anatomical anomalies. There is agenesis or hyperplasia of one Mullerian duct. It may be alone or accompanied by rudimentary horn and the abortion rate are uh, as high as 51%. So unicorn uterus, once we diagnose, we have to be very careful with the patient. Keep her on progesterone and all the modalities we can save her pregnancy. Bioconvert uterus, 10% of the anomalies, uh, uh, it falls, uh, has a small uh, part in the anomalies. And there is incomplete fusion of uterine horns at level of fundus. Two separate but communicating endometrial cavities we will all see in our 3D ultrasounds. And abortion rates are pretty high, 32%. Here you can see a uh, hysteroscopic view of a periosteal endometrial polyp. And so this was the culprit in this patient. And once it was taken out, she had a healthy pregnancy. So uh, of course the iatrogenic causes intrauterine adhesions uh, by repeated DNCs and uh, the patient lands up in Asherman syndrome. And uh, the cause is decreased blood supply once again, poor implantation. And of course the infection also has its role to play. And the abortion rates are pretty high, 40%. So let's have a look at the endocrine factors. Actually, the endocrine factors are uh, very much uh, to blame in our scenario. And uh, we have to remember the endocrine factors uh, in the first go. And what uh, uh, we suggest that get her hormonal analysis done. Because see, once we get her uh, levels of hormones, prolactin, thyroid, uh, FSH, LH, even AMH, when you can uh, diagnose a poor ovarian reserve. So just get a hormone profile done. So we, we can keep track of all the hormones. So LPD, as we all know, progesterone is essential for implantation and maintenance of pregnancy. A defect in the corpus luteum will cause impaired progesterone production. Uh, what happens in diabetes mellitus? Uh, uh, once it is poorly controlled, we have both early and late pregnancy losses. But once uh, she's well controlled, you don't have to worry. She will uh, not have pregnancy losses. So a tight control of the diabetic status is very important. Another endocrine cause is thyroid. We uh, do it in our routine checkups also. So once the patient is hypo or hyperthyroid, she will have increased thyroid antibodies. Uh, no, sorry, this is uh, the uh, TPO antibodies. We can uh, always, even if uh, she's complaining of, uh, um, if she, uh, once she's complaining of RPL and even if the uh, thyroid levels are normal, get a TPO antibodies done because many patients uh, come out with positive TPO antibodies and then we can put her on uh, uh, anti, uh, our thyroid uh, drugs, l and the like. And uh, also hyperprolactinemia is the culprit so protecting levels always should be done in our RPL patients.
PCS, another burning problem in our uh, practice scenario. So once we test her FSH LH, we will come to know about her uh, and testosterone. So all these will uh, give us a, a picture of the PCOS uh, hormones and of course the polycystic ovaries. So what happens here is there is, there is increased insulin resistance, there is increased LH, increased testosterone and androstenedione, and all these affect the endometrium adversely. And the miscarriage rates also shoot up to 20 to 40%. And uh, this we have seen in our practice that whenever we treat a PCOS patient and she has a uh, pregnancy, many a times they abort. Endometriosis, again, has to be kept in mind and the cause is hyperestrogenemia. So uh, let's now switch over to our uh, very other very important cause of RPL is the immunological causes. And uh, these are, again, we can uh, classify them into autoimmune factors where certain autoimmune diseases are associated with pregnancy loss. The first is the SLE, and mainly there is first trimester loss uh, and uh, in SLE, and second and third trimester loss also, you can come, uh, both are comparable, actually. So SLE has to be kept in mind, and of course, the uh, big giant is the antiphospholipid syndrome. So this uh, APLA, we all always have to uh, test for the patient because uh, we never know when she acquired because this is an acquired form of uh, autoimmune disease. And uh, mostly the, as we all know, it is a second trimester loss, uh, it is a late uh, pregnancy loss. So uh, how do we diagnose this APLA? Uh, all of us are aware there should be one lab and one clinical criteria. The clinical criteria could be venous or arterial thrombosis or a history of recurrent pregnancy loss. So one thing we have in hand, RPL she box in with that history. So one clinical criteria is complete. RPL she has. The second is our lab criteria. One lab criteria has to be fulfilled. Uh, we have to get lupus anticoagulant and anti-cardiolipin antibody. So now here, both of them should be high in medium or high titers. So once uh, we have a high titer of, of ACL and uh, lupus anticoagulant, the, our lab, lab criteria are met and this uh, comes to be uh, 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 in about six to eight weeks apart. So when we repeat our titers, there has to be a period of six to eight weeks uh, interval. And when on two intervals, the patient comes out to be uh, APLA positive with medium or high titer uh, race, she is a patient of APLA. Uh, because they say that low to mild positive uh, uh, titers can also be found in viral illness. So what about the alloimmune factors? These are, uh, one is blocking antibodies. Maternal and uh, maternal anti-fetal antibodies block maternal cell mediated response. And these antibodies, if an absent, they cause fetal rejection. So blocking antibodies are actually useful for the mother. And NK cells, the CD56 and NK-like cells secrete a transforming growth factor, beta-like substance crucial to the maintenance of pregnancy. So uh, NK cells, titers now with all the advance in our uh, uh, pathology investigations, the NK uh, cell titer, though it is very costly, is being done. And uh, these uh, cells when present in endometria and early gestational residue of women with RPL. So it has, they, their presence have been found in uh, our uh, patients suffering from RPL. The T helper cells, the, the alloimmune factors uh, in which we have the Th1 and Th2, aberrant or inappropriate Th1 stimulation will result in overproduction of cytokines that have deleterious effect on the conceptus. And Th1 versus Th2 cytokine profile is associated with human pregnancy uh, loss and success respectively. So the Th1 is the bad uh, T helper cells and the TH2 are, is our good friend. So always remember the genetic causes whenever there is a blighted ovum or a very early pregnancy loss. So uh, the incidence is as high as 90% in a patient of an embryonic pregnancy or blighted ovum. It is 50% when a patient aborts at 8 to 11 weeks and the incidence of genetic causes is 30% 
when the patient aborts at 16 to 19 weeks and it is only 6 to 12 percent when the patient aborts above 20 weeks so always keep genetic chromosomal causes when it's an early abortion so uh, fetal chromosomal abnormalities of course very important this may be due to abnormalities in the egg in the sperm or both so the most common chromosomal defects are trisomy monosomy and poly polyploidy so, uh, of course the uh, uh, female factors are important but also the sperm aneuploidy has to be kept in mind which directly influences the rate of aneuploidy in the conceptors so uh, the main uh, things we have to worry about are the translocations and uh, then secondly the mosaicism and the inversion so it can be a uh, reciprocal uh, translocation or the robertsonian translocation so here they depict the way the reciprocal uh, uh, translocation occurs what happens that two non homologous chromosomes exchange information so these are uh, exchanging information and then we get the uh, defective chromosomes and in robertsonian translocation what happens to non homologous acrocentric chromosomes break at the centromere and the long arms fuse and then we have a defective genetic makeup the short arms are often lost so uh, let's also uh, look at the single gene disorders these are uh, mainly the second and third trimester losses and it is uh, the alpha thalassemia that we have to always remember the myotonic dystrophy the x linked dominant disorders which are a uh, uh, big range and uh, hereditary thrombophilias have not to be forgotten and mainly they uh, the thrombophilias are associated with recurrent pregnancy loss in the first and later trimesters uh, what happens is there are microthrombi in the placenta impaired uteroplacental circulation so uh, thrombophilias then factor 5 laden gene mutation then protein c and s deficiency the anti thrombin 3 deficiency and hyperhomocysteinemia where the, uh, it is uh, mthfr uh, mutation so uh, these uh, among these of course the mostly they are all very pretty costly tests but hyperhomocysteinemia is not very costly so in in the uh, whole list hyperhomocysteine levels can always be done for the patient so bacterial vaginosis, as we all know, has, their, has its role to play in infertility as well as uh, recurrent pregnancy loss, as well as uh, IUGR, preterm labor. So it is bacterial vaginosis has always to be remembered. And actually the whole uh, cascade of uh, infertility, RPL, then IUGR. So the common factors are the infections and the decreased blood supply. So uh, we have the AMSELS criteria for diagnosis of bacterial vaginosis. There is a thin homogeneous discharge. There is a release of an amine. Uh, of course, it, it le uh, leads to a fishy odor on addition of uh, potassium hydroxide to the vaginal discharge. And as we remember from our college days, those clue cells we saw on the microscope in our labs. And the vaginal pH is, uh, in this case, is more than 4.5. And the male culprits are the trichomonal, uh, trichomonal vaginalis and the candida albicans. And what are the uh, infections uh, which are responsible? The viral, we have the coxsackie and the parvovirus. And the bacterial infections, we have uh, bacterial vaginosis, tuberculosis, and chlamydia trichomatis. And another thing which is not to be uh, forgotten are the semen infections. So, uh, many a times uh, when we see that uh, the patient is coming with RPL, we get a husband uh, semen culture also done and give her uh, and uh, give the husband antibiotics for 21 days, mainly uh, doxycycline. And a word about the decreased ovarian reserve, we've already discussed about it and celiac disease. 
this actually has so many prongs to the whole problem that uh, infertility is one of them untreated and even subclinical associated with pregnancy loss menstrual disorders and infertility so how do we go about it of course a proper history taking we ask the gestational age and characteristics whether it was an, an embryonic pregnancy or a live embryo so whether the patient aborted uh, very early or she aborted after uh, the uh, first trimester so uh, the catch here is that uh, mostly the uh, patients who are having recurrent pregnancy loss at a early stage they will be uh, the uh, the etiology will be chromosomal or endocrine and the patients who complain of uh, pregnancy loss at a later stage that is in the second trimester and onwards will have uh, anatomical or immunological causes as the etiology so we just have to keep this in mind so uh, half the problem is solved and of course we have to take leading history of uh, excessive vaginal mucoid discharge which is there in uh, bacterial vaginosis and incompetent os and wetness uh, suggestive of uh, cervical incompetence uh, also uh, take the history of any whether patient is taking any medication like anti progestins uh, anti neoplastic agents inhalational anesthetics all uh, which have environmental uh, factors to play and any history of uh, exposure to ionizing radi radiation and uh, environmental heavy metals toxins always suspect uh, uh, some uh, you know anatomical cause when she complains of menorrhagia like a some lupus fibroid or uterine malformation could be there history of metrorrhagia could be a some mucus infected polyp uh, and uh, if she is uh, take a history of uh, she giving up dysmenorrhea so of course it points out towards endometriosis or and adenomyosis and dyspareunia of course we have to take a leading history of dyspareunia if she gives us a history of short cycles you can always suspect uterine phase defect and also short cycles uh, we have learned in our infertility also indicate uh, poor ovarian reserve so that could also be the cause and another uh, history when she has irregular cycles with prolonged period of amenorrhea so it could point out towards pcos or hyperprolactinemia or she could be having uterine synecy once she says i have period uh, i have periods but then again i have periods of amenorrhea so remember these points of course obstetric history we have already talked about we should be knowing uh, whether she married uh, early or uh, like very early marriage could also be the cause of uh, uh, rpl because the patient is very uh, young and there are many other factors uh, to it but if she is of course have had a marriage delayed marriage then also we can suspect poor ovarian reserve at what gestational age the prior pregnancy have occurred and a pregnancy losses have occurred and whether it was associated with pain bleeding whether silent or missed abortion so uh, if she says i had pain i had bleeding that usually it is in a second trimester and we can think of the anatomical causes or apla but if she says no i never had any bleeding and it was just when i went for a sonography and i uh, came to uh, find that it was a missed abortion so then there is the role of genetic causes and maybe hormonal causes also so uh, this we have to be very vigilant about we have to take a history of diabetes tuberculosis hypertension and if it is overt diabetes mellitus uh, we all know the hyperglycemia is embryotoxic and uh, there are vascular complications with also and of course the history of hypo or hyperthyroidism will lead to uh, an ovulatory dysfunction and luteal phase defect so luteal phase defect as we all know there are causes uh, there are all interwoven causes pcos endometriosis uh diabetes hyperprolactinemia uh, all can cause lpt in that term
history of connective tissue disorders if she gives us a uh, history of thrombotic events of course uh, we have to be on our alert it has to be uh, apla or any other uh, thrombophilia then any uh, we have to take leading history whether she's had any dnc mtps amputation cervix bone biopsies any surgeries like myomectomy metroplasty so all can lead to incompetent os and uh, family history of recurrent spontaneous abortions chronic medical conditions thrombotic events because uh, actually these uh, entities you know they run into families so we have to be a bit alert about the family history also personal history as we all know smoking tobacco chewing alcohol consumption these are the culprits in every uh, field of our obstetrics so what do we examine we see for obesity we see for hirsutism we look out for acanthosis and thyroid enlargement we do uh, do a breast examination always do a breast examination her prolactin levels are normal but still if she has uh, uh, on uh, palpation if she has uh, you know this um, milk expression from the breast so she could be a patient of hyperprolactinemia and of course hemorrhagia will give us pallor for the patient and per abdomen if there is an irregular contour maybe she has uh, no multiple fibroids per speculum may show a myomatous polyp protruding out through the os and uh, bluish black puckered spots always pathognomonic of endometriosis in our perspective examination and uh, just have a look at the cervix whether there is any scarring and any signs of infection whether there is a tender swollen red vagina in bacterial vaginosis or a discharge from the cervix which could be due to endometritis so perspeculum is always very important once we keep the causes in our mind we can be on the lookout so what do you do for the examination we we do a pelvic examination a pv will reveal uh, maybe a firm uterus uh, because of a fibroid it could be a retroverted fixed uterus conical tenderness and cobblestone feeling of the uterus sacrals as we have all learned in our college days it could be endometriosis and always keep uh, endometriosis and psoas on the top list of of the endocranial causes an asymmetrical enlargement of uterus with tenderness cause adenomyosis could be there so uh, now how do we uh, evaluate our patient so uh, what they have recommended is that this is a list which we have to get done for all our patients all our rpl patients so actually hysterosalpingography and hysteroscopy could be replaced by a 3d Uh, transvaginal ultrasound because now it is the uh, you know uh, now uh, it is the day of tvs uh, 3d 4d so we could do that but uh, hysteroscopy uh, has other advantages also so we could do both a tvs 3d tvs and a hysteroscopy for the patient and always get, get the apla test done uh, for the lupus anticoagulant and the anti cardiolipin antibodies igg igm always get a hormonal profile done of the patient uh, always get a hpa 1c and two uh, r postprandial we could just get a glucose challenge test done for this patient so uh, if she comes above 140 uh, in a 75 glucose challenge test uh, she is pre diabetic and we have to uh, be on our guard and karyotyping of both parents and if the abortus is available we could do that so these three or four things we always have to be done uh, be doing for our rpl patients that is our hormone profile just uh, tell her that we'll get your blood test done and for these blood tests get three things done one is a hormonal profile the second is an apla test done and the third is a karyotype so these three tests always get done for the rpl patient and fourthly is the uh, 3d 3d uh, tvs then some tests are arbitrary you can get them then you might not get them done it is your choice if she is uh, having irregular cycles and you are uh, so already we have talked about hormones and serum progesterone 
just to know whether the patient has progesterone deficiency and uh, a TB PCR culture, if there are constitutional symptoms, the patient looks that uh, we, uh, she might have tuberculosis and homocysteine levels, as we said, they are not very costly. You can get them done if you suspect thrombophilias. And uh, of course, this is important because once we have done a pervaginal examination and we think she has, a, has discharge, then get a high vaginal swab culture and sensitivity. And of course, TB, PCR, which is all our choice according to the patient. So management, of course, uh, as all of us know, it is according to the cause. Once we have diagnosed uh, uh, an atypical cause like um, a septum, we can do a hysteroscopic uh, resection of the septum. If she has uh, uh, intrauterine adhesions, we will do an adhesiolysis, septum resection, removal of submucous fibroids and polyps, and cerv cervical circulage if indicated. We have to keep in mind PCOS, and of course, we can give her uh, myonistol and decarostol preparations, and of course, metformin is our gold standard. It always works. So, patients who are very high LH and not responding, give them metformin. Butyl phase defect, of course, we have our gold standard diatogestron and other progesterones. We have to keep the patient after the ovulation, we have to start our uh, progesterones. Thyroid, of course, we'll treat and optimizing the HbA1c levels and correcting the hyperprolactinemia by our cabagulin and bromovicriptine, of course, now we don't use. So what about the uh, once we have the antiphospholipid syndrome diagnosed or maybe if she's always giving a history of mid-trimester abortions, we can do it prophylactically. We keep her on aspirin. And of course, uh, as Dr. Riti was saying, it has to be started pre-pregnancy. So mostly three months before pregnancy, if the patient uh, is giving you history of repeated abortions, keep her on aspirin. And heparin, of course, low weight, molecular weight, heparin is uh, the gold standard for our APLA patients. And uh, this ultrasound viability is not a must now because in our IVF patients, we start with uh, heparin from the time of beta HCG and uh, LMWH is the modality of choice though in patients who are poor we can give the uh, normal heparin also. Intravenous immunoglobulins the role is controversial and corticosteroids they say give only in APLA when the patient also has SLE. And warfarin should be given, of course, uh, in consultation with a physician. If previous arterial thrombosis, uh, patient gives a history of previous arterial thrombosis in the second and third trimester. So, of course, uh, hyperobosteinemia. we know the treatment is always there by the combination of folic acid, vitamin B6 and vitamin B12. And we have to give it pre-pregnancy. Low-dose aspirin, heparin, full dose uh, heparin because we give 40 milligrams in our patient per day, but uh, it is, I think, 80 milligrams in a case of DVT, deep vein thrombosis, and warfarin whenever there is arterial thrombosis. So always we have to do a screening and treatment of the bacterial vaginosis. Mainly bacterial vaginosis is uh, treated by uh, clindazole and uh, uh, metronidazole combination and uh, screening and treatment of occult genital tuberculosis and chlamydia screening and treatment. So immunotherapy, this is a new modality which is drawn uh, called the nature's immunosuppressant due to inhibition of immune cells at maternal fetal interface. So though the treatment is our old progesterone, but uh, they mean to say that progesterone is helping in other way. It is building the immunity of uh, our mothers also. And of course, it is safe and inexpensive uh, in a way uh, when we have to keep the patient on heparin. So of course, that is pretty costly. 100 milligram BID, vaginal suppositories beginning three days after the ovulation. 
So what do we do about the genetic losses? So there we have to uh, counsel the patient and plan our uh, treatment. We we can uh, offer her in vitro fertilization. We can offer her PGD pre genetic diagnosis by uh, day three blastomy or biopsy. Actually now uh, days uh, the uh, pre genetic diagnosis is coming up in a big way. What they do is they take the uh, culture from the culture media itself okay. so we don't need to go for an invasive test and uh, fluorescent in hybrid uh, fish method is good use for uh, <laughs> and blastos is by <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so sorry, this is what uh, you... we were saying <laughs> that plastic bags is now being replaced by the culture media. We take the uh, culture media and then we uh, find out the chromosomal anomalies. This is just a picture of the uh, day, uh, three day old embryo, and here they are taking the uh, cell for biopsy. In this they, they have shown the fish technique. So uh, one more modality which we tend to forget is our reassurance. There is a new uh, science coming up which is psychoneuroimmunology. They say that the stress affects our immune system and changes in the TH2 response in endometrium to TH1 response uh, comes uh, when there is stress uh, in the patient and also the adrenaline release reduces the placental blood flow. So we have to counsel a patient to be de-stressed, to take it uh, easy and to be relaxed. So this will also help in reducing her pregnancy losses. So the uh, friends, the prognosis for successful pregnancy is good. Live birth rates after normal and abnormal diagnostic evaluations are 77 and 71 percent respectively so it's a pretty good number so we always have to be think always have to be thinking positive and there is always hope for this bundle of joy for our patients thank you Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Rekha ji. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just a second. My video is not on. I don't know why. It's, huh? it's uh, yes. Yes. Uh, other participants? So, Rekha ji, thank you so much. You have covered all the aspects of this recurrent pregnancy loss. So, Rekha ji, I have received some questions um, online. If you permit me, I can take some questions as the program is going live on the YouTube also. So, after kuch questions you may not be able to see, but there's a lot of questions we have received. There's a lot of appreciations also. Just a second, yeah. Yeah. As you have uh, very nicely covered regarding this immunological causes also. So there's one question by Dr. Uh, Rekha ji. Huh? Uh, yes, yes. Yeah. So the, the question is, uh, how much immunotherapy is helpful in RPL issue? As currently, the most widely used immunotherapy for recurrent pregnancy loss is injecting the patient with white blood cells obtained from the potential father. Uh, Dr. Ritu, can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, yeah, I'm repeating. Uh, here I uh, see the question is, how much is the immunotherapy is helpful in the cases of RPL issue? Hmm? Are you getting, Dr. Ritu? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Ah, next, in the same consequence, the doctor asked, as currently the most widely used immunotherapy for RPL is injecting the patient with WBCs obtained from the potential father. Uh, WBCs obtained from the potential father. Potential father. Huh. Actually, uh, this uh, doctor, what you have asked the question, uh, actually in India, we are doing the immunotherapy as a separate branch. So we are not doing the immunotherapy because we, Rekaji, as per my knowledge, we are to sending for the immunotherapy to the different centers. Huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, huh. uh, like the uh, intralipids and uh, yeah. uh, immunoglobulins, like they are not very, you know, uh, uh, we are not very comfortable because of the, uh, the patient can have anaphylactic reactions. So uh, actually I don't have in, uh, experience personally. Uh, have you tried Dr. Ritu? Yeah, yeah. Intralipids so I have used. Intralipids is not a problem, but for the immunotherapy, whole, whole soul proper immunotherapy, we are referring a patient that we are not handling. Okay, okay. The patient is coming that with the recurrent pregnancy loss history of that. So for the immunotherapy, we are referring with the opinion of the fetal medicine also, we are referring to the some centers. Okay, huh? so because Pune is quite advanced and you have... Yeah. Uh, different uh, sections okay so that yeah yeah and uh, how costly is the immunotherapy very costly very costly na? so all patients can't afford and the actually <laughs> mumbai uh, not in pune was also not we have to send to the patient to mumbai yeah ha, and the role is not actually proven so True. i think uh, when we are uh, on heparin and aspirin we are much more you know uh, uh, we feel much more uh, comfortable and we know that she will uh, because so many patients on, on heparin and aspirin have got a fruitful pregnancy and we have got the experience so I think uh, immunotherapy is still on the you know uh, it, it has to be yeah, the more can afford also and we have to explain the patient everything what are the uh, pros and cons of course the cost is a very very important factor to deal with the patients Huh. Although the percent of uh, this uh, rep uh, recurrent pregnancy loss already have a lot of burden of the financial burden, emotional burden. So as uh -huh. I very beautifully covered all the aspects, the tender loving care is also a very, very important part in the patients of this. Uh -huh. We have already beautifully covered. So there is one more question. Uh, this is from Dr. Sarah. Uh, she has joined from the Kuwait. Huh? So what... Hey, welcome. Okay, yeah. So, what treatment is good if the patient is having antiphospholipid syndrome, which is the one causes of the repeated miscarriage? I think she is joined late because you have already covered for the antiphospholipid syndrome also. Huh? Okay, so uh, uh, we can repeat it for her. Yeah. Like yeah. Uh, there is one lab criteria and one clinical criteria that has to be fulfilled. And in the clinical criteria, if she is giving a history of thrombosis in the past, maybe with pregnancy or without pregnancy. So then we have to be um, uh, on the lookout for APLA and also our history of RPN. That also is a clinical criteria. So two clinical criteria, we can have one of them, either a history of thrombosis or a history of RPN. And... Uh, for the diagnosis of APLA, one clinical criteria and one lab criteria has to be fulfilled. The lab criteria constitutes the uh, IgGM, IgM antibodies of the lupus anticoagulant and the uh, antibody titers of the anticardiolipid antibody. So the ACL and the lupus anticoagulant both have to be tested in our labs. And when we have a high titer, high or medium titer of both of these uh, tests, uh, four to six weeks apart both uh, like uh, once you have high titer then again you test after four to six weeks again you have high titer that means she has uh, APLA so if one clinical and one lab criteria is fulfilled you uh, are sure that she has APLA and then you put her on aspirin and heparin yeah thank you thank you a uh, very beautifully explained so till we receive more questions Rekhaji, now we have covered the one session of the program, the academic portion. So yes. my, this program is the icons and conversation with Dr. Ritu. So now I'm coming for the non-academic. Okay, so, okay. 
rapid fire round for you you have to answer in the one word whatever the questions i am asking you without taking much time okay okay so here i start which is your favorite color come Pardon? on say quick your favorite Any, i didn't i didn't get the question your favorite color color pink pink okay your favorite fruit fruit yeah mango okay the place where which you love to visit any you know scenic beauty place like name name the place name the place nainital nainital okay okay uh, other thing what motivated you to become a gynecologist a doctor or especially a gynecologist uh you know the babies they, they give you so so much of joy so uh, being with babies is a big joy in itself okay 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 so you were a tea lover or a coffee person tea lover in our college days okay 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 so you like strawberry or vanilla flavor which flavor is your favorite vanilla okay okay so any message you want to give for the upcoming doctors because this program is very popular among the youngsters the upcoming gynecologists because they are able to clear whatever their questions in their mind so any message you want to give to the upcoming gynecologists to become uh, yes dr ritu i i am uh, totally you know i'm amazed at your uh, you know uh, managing uh, Uh, you know competence because uh, in spite of the you know uh, uh, academic uh, front you always uh, have this note of enjoyment so <laughs> I, i'm really you know happy with that note because see academics once you uh, rapid fired me i became so happy so that uh, part i always will look up to for all your cmes and i enjoyed your pandit show also with all the celebrities of mumbai of uh, delhi and all the big you know uh, stalwarts and another thing is that uh, like every tuesday all our you know junior uh, doctors we we always uh, remember that aaj to bahut sari cheezon ka hum log ko samadhan milega matlab whatever the topic is so that matlab uh, is a very good part that we have something in hand like something to look every week look up to so uh, this uh, i realize that every tuesday dr ritu is conducting a cme and that too in a very you know comfortable time this 8:30 is so comfortable like no hurries no worries no patients all you know relax and sit and uh, you know uh, share the academic excellence so i really congratulate you dr ritu and i really look up to you you know as a great you know uh, academician like uh, hardly there are people with practice everyone just goes low into you know uh, their moods matlab this is a mood elevator actually we meet you we, we meet other people we chat and we uh, discuss so uh, every week we have something to look up to so i really you know congratulate you for your you know this very very innovative uh, idea of uh, you know discussing things and i really thank you for all your time and i think the whole week you are so busy and then one uh, on tuesday evening you sit with us so you know really hats off to you dr ritu and no, i'm no. really lucky to have you as my friend it's my pleasure also rekha ji you are the icon for today not me huh? you are only praising me huh? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, dr nishan are but you... i i think uh, like see uh, what you are gifting us with is really unique matlab this is a unique mm-hmm. gift for all of us we can share the platform we can discuss and any topic for practice everything otherwise what happens you keep on seeing patients you keep on but hardly you get time to revise and connect so that is what you are giving us and uh, uh, we really you know we can't thank you enough but just keep on the good work dr ritu thank you thank you thank you so much dr nishant are you able to see any more questions so you can take no ma'am no ma'am Okay. Okay. So there is one comment from Dr. Vala Ali. Yeah, uh, he is also saying the thanks a lot. You can see, yeah, uh, he, he has just left. Yeah. So thank Especially, you, thank you, uh, Dr. Ritu. One more thing that I forgot to mention is the international, uh, you know, exposure that we get. So that <laughs> is the main, you know, <laughs> thing thing that is, you know, the, the 
source of our you know attraction and we feel like we are connected with the you know outside countries and that is something very unique so please keep on this good work uh, yeah yeah thank you thank you thank you so much congratulations Sam. once again yeah thank you thank you dr sabur dr sabur is the president of the kanda society he is also writing the nice lecture yeah thank you dr sabur for joining so with this friends we will wind up for the show for the today so next week uh, we are going to meet on 1st september at the regular time of the show every thursday 8:30 pm so next week is will be the national nutrition week and that will be a public awareness program on the nutrition and i am going to speak on that besides that on the 25th we are having one insta live show on the dysmenorrhea same on the shield platform so all of you are welcome for that interactive discussions so thank you thank you shield thank you to my dear friend nishan prachi sahiti and chitra and best wishes for the chitra for her marriage so with this we will wind up for the today thank you once again rekha ji for taking out your time for us thank you thank you once again yeah thank you